All right, all right, all right. I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. I'm excited. I want to tell you something. When I was driving in today, I really felt the Lord put on my heart this. And please write it in your notes. It's time to grow up. Now, right away, you'd be like, oh, my gosh, like Pastor Aaron. It was just so laughy and huggy, and Brandon was on the stage. And then you say amen, and you just tell everyone, grow up. What are you calling? You just begin by saying you're immature. Well, well <laughs> interesting. I'm having this kind of chuckle with God in the car. To say it's time to grow up does not mean you called someone immature. But, of course, for all of us to search our hearts, we do always find places where we are not mature, and the opposite of mature is immature. But it's not calling anyone immature. It's simply saying it's time to grow up to that next level. It's time to grow up. Look at the days we're in. Look at how crazy they are. Look at what is happening. People need a best friend more than ever. People don't just need a best friend. They need a best friend that actually has a word of life, a word in season more than ever. People need insight more than ever. People have to be sharp against deception and, and lukewarmness more than ever. The wiles of the enemy more than ever. Church culture settling into this lukewarm comfort zone. And I just said lukewarm, here it comes again, you know. Uh, it is, you know, more than ever. And, and what we really need to do is we, it's time to grow up. I mean, what else needs to happen for us to say, you know what, it's time for me to reexamine everything I'm doing in my Christian walk and line it up with the Scriptures. You see, as long as we're following the Scriptures, we're safe. It's only when we start playing church and doing things by rote, you know what I mean, uh, that we fall into trouble. But as long as we're constantly holding up our walk against the Scriptures, we're safe. So it's time really just to hold our life up against the Scriptures, uh, to come back to what Jesus said, to come back to what Paul walked in. Um, and it is time. It is time to grow up. I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy 1, verses 6 through 8. Are we all there? And it says this, in Deuteronomy 1, verses 6 through 8, it says, The Lord our God spoke unto us in Horeb, Mount Horeb, and said, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Underline that. You've dwelt long enough here. Um, the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness. Remember, the Lord had brought them out of Egypt but he brought them out of Egypt to bring them into the land of milk and honey. Remember, the Lord brought us out of the world, out of the sinking Titanic, out of the snares, you know, and the Broadway leading to destruction, but not just to leave us in a howling wilderness, but to actually bring us into abundant life, right? To bring us into victorious Christian living, to bring us into a cup that runneth over. Isn't it great just to remind ourselves of that? Because sometimes even we can hyper-spiritualize the wilderness experience and somehow like, oh yeah, the Lord will save you out of Egypt. Oh yeah, he'll save you out of the world. But yeah, the Christian journey is carrying a cross, true. But then we go to this caricature of the cross where it means that the Christian experience is supposed to be lacking joy, lacking power, lacking your wildest dreams come true in all of what Christ can do through you, right? So what ends up happening is you get Christians just settling for monotony, just creating their own little comfort zones, creating a own little a nook that's good, but as you know, good can become the enemy of best, right? So the Israelites here in their wilderness wanderings had found a place called Horeb. Horeb was cool, right? It's not like numbers where there were venomous serpents coming out of, this, uh, out of the ground. Uh, there's no armies here uh, around the other bend waiting to attack them. Horeb was a cool spot. God knew that, so he comes into them in their cool spot, their, their little place to catch their breath, if you will, a kind of place where you could just pitch your tent, right? You ever go to the beach and you're kind of searching for where you could kind of, you know, those cheap little pegs for your little tent or whatever, and you're just looking for a good spot where you could actually feel like it grips so the wind won't take your little tent at the beach, right? You, you follow what I'm saying, right? They found this little spot in the wilderness where you could actually just pitch your tent and just stay for a while. 
Then God comes and he says, you've been here long enough now. God loves us enough to come to us in our little cool out spots, our little places we create to catch our breath, or even the places where we deceive ourselves into thinking that this is all that the spiritual journey is all about. He loves us enough to come to that place and say, hey, you've been here long enough. And then he continues, verse 7, turn you, take your journey, go to the Mount of the Amorites, and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plain, in the hills, in the valley, in the south, by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, unto Lebanon, and the great river, the river Euphrates. He's saying the Amorites, the land of the Amorites, write down in your notes Jericho. He's saying there's a wall of Jericho. There are impenetrable walls waiting for you to march around that are going to fall. There is a place where walls are going to fall, where change is going to happen, where crooked places are going to be made straight and rough places are going to be made smooth, but you've got to leave where you are to go there. You've been here long enough. And he's reminding them of abundant life. He's reminding them that when I brought you out of Egypt, I didn't say I was going to bring you to a Horeb. No, I said I was going to bring you into a land of milk and honey. I said I was going to bring you into a place of such abundance. Verse 8, behold, and he reminds them again, I have set the land before you. He's saying, remember that land of milk and honey? And it's the same thing the Lord says to us as we just kind of settle for just this predictable Christianity. He comes in and says, hey, I, I have abundant life for you. Hey, I'm able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Hey, you know, there is a rest for the people of God, not in heaven. There is a supernatural rest for you even here, laboring yet resting supernaturally therein. Behold, I've set before you, verse 8, the land. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, amen. And basically what he's saying is this, I promised it to you. Let's go to Acts chapter 20 now. And that was not a part of the message. That was just something the Lord put on my heart while driving in to get us to really examine and say, okay, you know, what Horeb am I at, right? Uh, Horeb is not a bad place. Horeb is actually a good place. Uh, But it's a place where we can end up settling. And the reality is that I believe if you look at the landscape of the American church today, um, that, that we all... Uh, can say that we are in a Horeb culture. You don't hear many messages about busting through and pressing on. You don't hear many announcements of prayer and tarrying services and waiting on the Holy Spirit of God break out and break through. You know, I can, if you remember, there was a time, you know, 15 years ago where those kind of words were just, you would hear them a lot, breakthrough, break out, right? Break in, break something. A- anything that's bad, break it. You know what I mean? Any shackles, break them. The anointing, you would hear this stuff. And today it's just very much become like a very Horeb experience. We have to all look and say, wow, You know, while it says give thanks for all things, and even right now we have so much to be thankful for, you know, our freedom to gather and our coming together, but we also have to say, okay, Lord, while this is a good thing, where have I settled in, you know, uh, and instead of pitching a tent, I'm actually starting to lay a cement foundation. Pitching a tent means I'm just here for a moment as I'm journeying onto all that God has for me. I'm just here as I'm continuing to go deeper. Laying a cement foundation is, you know what? I know I'm not going to a sinner's hell, and uh, this is safe, so I'm going to pitch right here. He came in, and he actually says in Deuteronomy 1, you've been here long enough. And then if you couple that with Hebrews chapter 5, you know, where the author says to the believers... You know, there's a time there where you ought to be teachers. There's a time where you ought to be teaching, but he says, but because of you settling, now you have to still be reminded of the basics of what Christianity is all about. He says, therefore, in Hebrews 5, let's move on to maturity. So you see, remember we said for every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture? The Old Testament picture is him telling the Israelites, you've been at this mountain long enough, it's time to move, it's time to grow. 
And then in Hebrews 5, he says, hey, you know what, there's a time. Uh, you ought to be teachers by now. You ought to be leading ministries. You ought to be taking that baton and running off, running through your own troops, leaping over your own walls, but you still have to sit down and be fed with milk and be reminded of the basics of what Christianity is about. Oh, we're supposed to gather. Oh, we're supposed to be nice to each other. Oh, we're supposed to forgive each other. Oh, we're supposed to not let bitterness brew in our heart. Oh, we're supposed to remember to sacrifice for the Lord. We have to be radical. Jesus said in the last days, the hearts of many will grow cold. Beware of becoming a cold-hearted Christian. He says, we, we have to still keep reminding of the basics when you guys should now be out teaching others that. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen? Yo, we here to really hear from God today. All right. Because I'm going to tell you what, when me and Brother Carl and we're at Kensington and Allegheny, you better go out there with a word. You better go out there believing what you have to say because guess what? They, they're going to they're gonna see right through a cliche. If someone's standing in front of you with a handful of heroin needles, missing three fingers, don't have an eye, and they're standing there with blackened skin, and they're completely numb to hearing anything and everything. Sirens don't move them. The sound of gunshots don't move them. Nothing moves them. You better go out there believing what you're about to tell them. Amen? And the time is now where you've got to know it. We've got to move on. We've been at this mountain long enough. We've got to say goodbye to a slot machine Christianity. We're going to church. It's just going to a righteous casino where you just pull the pastor's arm, you get jackpot, and you walk out rejoicing. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. At Antioch, we believe and, and bear witness with the Scripture's strong, strong proclamation that we are to empower people. That's what it's about. It is about Paul's pouring into Timothy's, Timothy's turning into Paul's, and then those Paul's going out and finding other Timothy's and passing the baton down. Do you see that? In this day of just mega church Christianity and nothing against mega church per se, but you could be a mega church, but it doesn't mean you have to have a mega church mentality. Some churches are, 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 are less than 10 people and have a mega church mentality. So it's nothing against the mega church, but there is a mega church mentality today of everyone going in and passively getting, right? Passively receiving, and that's really all of what it's about. And if you get excited over the message, then it means you're on fire for God. You read the book of Acts, and, and, and fire was something that, you didn't, that, that the world saw. Fire was something where the non-believers had to even call it for what it was. What I'd like to do today is I'd like to look with the remaining time at Acts chapter 20. Um, Acts, the book of Acts, for those of us that are just maybe new in Acts, the book of Acts chronicles the first 30 years of the church. It's the first 30 years of the church. It is not a story of perfect Christians because there are none. They always say, if you're looking for the perfect church, you'll never find it. And if you do happen to find it, don't you join it because you'll mess it up, right? The book of Acts is not the story of the perfect church. You see dissensions in the book of Acts. You see hypocrisy in the church in the book of Acts. You see all the same stuff that you see today. It's not the chronicling of perfect Christians, but it is the chronicling of what happens when imperfect Christians realize that they are perfectly forgiven and yield themselves to God. That's what it's a story of. When imperfect Christians realize and know that the gospel makes them perfectly forgiven and they yield themselves to God and let God use them. I have 11 points that I want to pull out of this chapter today. 11 points, right? It's Paul's recipe for immovability. We want to write that down. That's the title of today's message. Paul's recipe for immovability. And while we are journeying through this, we have to look at two terms, being a cultural Christian or being a catalyst Christian. And I'm going to come back to that. And for those that don't know what a catalyst is, here's the definition. A catalyst is a person or a thing precipitating an event. Am I just a cultural Christian or am I a catalyst Christian? Am I looking to be that thing that causes an event where the Lord sends me? So maybe we should just read Acts 20 first, then come back and distill the points out. This is Paul's last missionary journey. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem 
where he is going to be arrested, where he is going to be tried, where he is going to be sent to Rome, and where he will eventually be beheaded. Paul was martyred through being beheaded, right? Let's read the chapter first, because maybe it's been a while since you've just taken in the narrative, right? I'm going to read from the King James. If you're following an NIV or any other version, just read along. Let's just take in the story first, because there's so much to get out of it just from the story. Then we're going to come back and we're going to look at these 11 points. Uh, if you read this chapter, uh, and maybe you'll get more points, me with a close reading and a prayerful reading, I distilled 11 points. Uh, Paul's going to say in this chapter, I'm immovable. This, these things don't move me. That's what he's going to say. And then, while he doesn't say, here's my reasons why, if you just look at all of the points he makes, you will see why he was immovable. So we're going to take those points and incorporate them into our lives. Does that sound good? All right, let's go. So why don't we jump in verse, chapter 20, verse 1. It says, And after the uproar was ceased... Paul called unto him the disciples, and he embraced them, and he departed to go to Macedonia. That means northern Greece. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece proper. Underline exhortation. In Acts 14, verse 22, we see him exhorting people that they would do what? Continue in the faith. So he's just basically, it's his last missionary journey. He knows that it's been prophesied that when he gets to Jerusalem, it's going to be bad and he's going to be put in chains. And what's he want to do with his final moments? Have some me time? What's he want to do with his final moments? Get, get all insular? No, he wants to go and look at the, in the eyes of as many believers as he can and exhort them. Acts 14, verse 22, shows us what his exhortation would look like. He would tell people, stay in the faith. And the next thing he would tell them in Acts 14, 22, it's through much tribulation that we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. Have your head on right when it comes to the price, uh, the sacrifice of, of walking in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, and it's the greatest privilege of all. So let's go. It says, verse 3, that when he came into Greece proper, he stayed there for three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to go back to northern Greece. So he's about to sail to Syria, but then he finds out that the religious Jews, the, the, the fragments of the religious mafia of that day, actually had a plan to kill him somewhere out at sea. So he catches word that there's a death threat and a price on his head, so he goes back into northern Greece. Let's keep reading. And verse 4, there accompanied him into Asia, because now um, he's going to go into Asia, which means Turkey, Sopater, right, and um, Berea of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius and Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. It's so beautiful that the Bible, Jesus says, them that honor me will I honor. Look at how the people that just journeyed with him are getting honored in the Bible forever. If you had asked them, you knew, with God, nothing's a, 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 a small deal. There's no such thing as, you know, this is small potatoes, what I'm doing. Everything with God is a big deal. Did they imagine that they would be memorialized in the Holy Bible forever as they were the ones who just decided to live radically and follow Paul, their leader, right, as he was following Christ. Verse 6, And we sailed away from Philippi, underline we, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and we came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode for seven days. Underline the we. Remember, up until this point, you'll see it say, and Paul went, and he went, and they went. Now it's speaking in the first person plural. We went. Who wrote uh, the book of Acts? Luke, the same one that wrote the gospel of Luke. Luke is now traveling with Paul at this point. I believe that Paul was getting so jacked up, as you read about his report in 2 Corinthians 11, that Luke was a physician. Luke the doctor, the Lord just sent Luke along just to make sure Paul was good. It's so true. The Lord will supply all of our needs. Here's Paul on this journey. He's dealing with some kind of condition. His, uh, his eyes, remember he said to the Galatians, my eyes are in such a bad place that if you saw me, you'd want to rip out your own eyes and give them to me. Well, the Lord gave him a doctor, so he's got a physician just traveling with him. 
So we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and we came unto them to Troas in five days, and we stayed there seven days. And upon the first day of the week, underline that, that is your first mention in the Bible that Christians gathered on the first day of the week. I understand different views, and people want to say that to be really spiritual is to meet on the Sabbath, you know, as opposed to Sunday, and Sunday, uh, the first three, you know, letters is the word sun, and that is a pagan phenomenon, beginning the day of the week with sun worship and all of that. Listen, we understand that Saturday is the Sabbath, right? But that was God's covenant with Israel. Christ now is our Sabbath every day. It says in Romans 14, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another person considers every day just as spiritual. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. It even says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, let no one judge you in what day or holy day, whether you still observe these feast days or anything, because Christ fulfilled it all. Now the focus is Christ. We meet the first day of the week because that's when the empty tomb was discovered. So here it is. Write down 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. That's where Paul even tells the Corinthian church, when you gather on the first day of the week, Let's take up an offering for the saints who are struggling. The Bible makes clear. We know what day we worship. We know uh, when the empty tomb was discovered, and that's what we're celebrating, right? So I, I believe some people needed to hear that because I think when people want to come along and get people back into the law and back into keeping Jewish feasts and all of these things, the first thing they do is get people uh, to think they're worshiping the wrong day of the week and that it's all about getting back to the Sabbath. Uh, the, the scriptures are clear. But see, it's a privilege and it's a blessing when you know your Bible, right? So upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart to depart the next day. And look at this. He continued his speech until midnight. So for those of you who come to church and an hour-long sermon is just a little much for you, um, the greatest evangelist and teacher and the one that wrote the majority of the New Testament, did, when you went to hear him, you weren't getting a sermonette. Spurgeon said sermonettes are for Christianettes. When you went to hear Paul, that man was going to, he, well, look at what it says here. He said he preached till midnight. Well, let's keep reading. It says, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus who fell into a deep sleep. And the idea in the Greek is he just kept nodding and waking up, kept nodding and waking up. And there's no knock on Eutychus. You don't know what he did as a trade, um, what his day looked like. Remember, some of these people that would sit here were actually in a form of servitude. Uh, so anyway, he dozes off, and what happens? He fell asleep, and as Paul was long preaching, it means Paul had more than five closings. Paul was giving it out. But as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep, fell down from the third loft, and was taken up dead. Verse 10, and Paul went down, fell on him, the same way the prophet Elijah fell on the dead person, and Elisha fell on him, and embracing him, he said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Paul raises this man from the dead. Verse 11, when he therefore was come up again, Paul, what does he do after going down and raising the man from the dead? Goes back up, and what does he do? Begins preaching again, it says he broke bread. It doesn't mean he stopped and had a meal. It means he gave out communion. It's in the Greek, he broke the bread. What is he doing? He is preaching the gospel, preaching the cross, leading saints to the cross, the cross, the cross. He broke bread and had eaten. And what did he do? Talked a long while now, even till the break of day. Went on preaching until the sun came up and then he left. Really interesting when we just look at what the church experience has been reduced to, and you look at in the book of Acts, the place they put the word of God. I know some believers, they break out in hives if they have to stay in church longer than two hours. I watch them. You can tell them they're losing their mind. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, you're losing? I don't say it because I'm the pastor. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, they're losing their mind, Lord. They're losing it. You know what I mean? Yo, how different? I mean, come on, y'all. Like, yo, <laughs> Like, what do we want to do with this? You know what I'm saying? Like, how different. The book of Acts has been preserved for us so we can always hold ourselves uh, and, and the times up against it and really look at what did it look like when people were really ignited by the love of God. 
and really believed that God was who he is and that God's word is what it was. So yeah, Paul preached. Paul preached it up. So let's keep reading. Verse 12, he brought the young man alive and people were not a little comforted. It means people were, were blown away. Verse 13, and we went before to ship. Now they're going to sail off again. And we sailed unto Assos. They're intending to take in Paul. So they were going to take Paul on the ship. But it says Paul um, had already minded himself to go on foot. We're not told why, but Paul decides, uh, I'm just going to walk you guys go ahead in the ship, and we'll meet at the next ministry point. Would you write in your notes 20 miles? Paul took a 20-mile walk. Can I ask you a question? Like, how important is it to you to exhort somebody? You want to know something the body needs a lot of today? Encouragers. Encouragers. I need encouragement. You need encouragement. People out there laboring need encouragement. Encourage, isn't it so powerful? Let me ask you this. When's the last time you got encouraged in the Lord? In the Lord, where it just had that. You know what I mean? Because the Lord takes anything, you know, that just seems in the everyday. And, and, and when Jesus is involved, it becomes supernatural. When's the last time you received supernatural encouragement? And it was right on time. And the person just said, hi, thinking of you. But, but it was sent from God, and you knew it. You, you, no, no, oh, you better, you better collect yourself some encouragement. And if you need some, come on up after service. I'll, I will be honored to encourage you, and I'll let you encourage me. We need that. Do you understand what I'm saying? How far will you go to encourage somebody? Look at what Paul's going through, and he knows that prison and possible martyrdom is waiting for him. But what's on his mind? Encouraging people. What is this the very opposite of? Selfishness. He want, look at him, he's now walking 20 miles. 20 miles just to go encourage somebody. Just to want to go and encourage someone. What would happen if we would see people just wanting to come to church? Let's say you already know the sermon. I already know the sermon. Oh, what's he preaching on Acts 20? I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a master's paper on Acts 20. <laughs> I don't need to go. I probably do it better than Pastor Aaron. Maybe so. But what about just coming to church and you're excited to just go and encourage somebody? One, to worship him, to blow kisses to the one who's just done so much and continues to do so much as our all in all. But then all around that is encourage folk, encourage people, speak a word of life. What would happen if everyone came to church and literally was asking God, God, I'm asking for some divine appointments today. It means I'm going to see a lot of people, but I believe that you have some appointments for me today because I believe what your Bible says, right? And would you give me a word in season for people while I'm there? Whoever it is, I want to speak a word of life. And how sweet does it feel when you actually get to speak a word and you see that word bless a soul? Paul's walking 20 miles on to encourage the next person. And it breaks my heart because how many today wouldn't even walk a mile? Wouldn't even drive a mile. Wouldn't even drive a mile. Paul walked 20 miles. Look, my brothers and sisters, when we stand before Jesus, all of us are going to realize the only reason we're there because of his blood and his work on the cross. No flesh will boast, right? But we at least want to... Fight the good fight to get in front of them with a right perspective so that we don't get in front and be like, oh, wow. That's what Christianity was all about. That's what love was. You understand? That's why it says fight the good fight of faith. That's why hearing, it all begins with hearing the word of God. But see, our flesh won't tell us this. Your flesh will tell you that you can watch the message later, right? Your flesh will tell you that you can watch it at home. And the flesh will tell you, you know what I mean? You kind of know it already. The flesh will not tell you this. I need this word every day. I need this preaching for my own self. Let's keep reading. So he's walking 20 miles. Verse 14, and when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. They basically just met up with him 20 miles later. And verse 15, we sailed from there and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and we tarried at Trogil. Trogri you read that. Tro yeah, that one. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul, verse 16, underline this, and this is where we're going to zero in. 
Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So check this out. It said the Feast of Unleavened Bread just passed, right? It means Passover had just passed. Fifty days after Passover was Pentecost. Do you follow that? That's why it's interesting that now you see why he's mentioning a week here, two days here, three days here. Paul is counting how many days because he wants to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. He wants to be there by Pentecost because that's when the city actually swelled up, you know, exponentially as Jewish males came from the then known world to worship. Paul wants to be in the middle of it all and he wants to be ready to be used by God. Not only that, but check this out. Paul, it's been prophesied to him that he's going to get locked up when he gets there. But what is he doing? He, is he, does it say he's dragging his feet to get there? No, what is he doing? He's, he's hasty to get there. But on the way there, he says, we have to go to Miletus. I'm hasty to get to what God has for me there, but on the way there, I got to go see them in, my, in, in, I'm sorry, in Ephesus and encourage them. So he wants to sail by Ephesus, verse 16, because he would not spend the time in Asia, which is Turkey, for he hasted because he wanted to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. I could read point one. Let me just read through, and then we're going to come back, okay? Are you guys following me? All right, we need you today. All right, let's zero in, all right? It says, and from Miletus, verse 17, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. So he can't make it to Ephesus, but he could go to Miletus, which is about 30 miles away, and he calls for the elders of Ephesus and says, hey, I need to see y'all. So what do they do? They RSVP and say, we can't make it. No, they make it. And how was it? 30 miles. Again, right away, when we look at this, we're, we're blown away, and we haven't even gotten into the marrow of the message yet. We're blown away when we just see that these things, this was what we today would call a big deal. They called this normal Christianity. Paul asking for elders to come around to assemble, to talk about the things of God. Yeah, of course I'm going to be in the place. RSVP, I don't need the RSVP. I'm going to be there. And, oh, and, oh, 30 miles away? No problem. No cars, no Amtrak, and no little jets. 30 miles. Wow. See, we could read over this and skip right over it, but when we really start reading between the lines, we see, wow, they really live this thing. And it looks good, doesn't it? And because we've got God's spirit, we're attracted to it. Notice that if you're a born-again Christian, nothing we've read so far is repulsive to you. Because by having God's spirit in you, like iron filings to a magnet, you're drawn to that. Even though it looks radical and, whoa, and your flesh is like, I don't know, I don't know. You're drawn to it because the spirit in you is the spirit that led them, is the spirit that wrote the scriptures. Do you notice right now you're being drawn to this? Yes or no? And if you're a believer and you're not being drawn to it, that just means right now you're carnal. What does carnal mean? Carnal means you're saved, but you act and think like an unsaved person. You just got to repent right now, <laughs> praise God, and get back on the good foot. Come on, let's go. So, verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Verse 18, and when they were come to him, he said to them, now listen, this is the sermon from Paul you never heard. When I say, tell me about Paul's sermons, you'll say, oh, when he's on Mars Hill. He's on Mars Hill preaching to the Athenian philosophers. Oh, you know, when he's preaching here, when he's preaching before Festus. This is a sermon Paul's giving to the elders of the church at Ephesus on the beach, basically, in Miletus. And this, is, this sermon is mind-blowing. Oh, fall in love with it today. It's really the sermon of Paul you've never heard. Let's go. He says this. Verse 18, you know that from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you in all seasons. Write down consistency. It says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and many temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Write in your notes, persevering. He just talked about near-death experiences, hits on his life and everything. One, you see I've been consistent. Two, you see I've never given up and thrown in the towel. Verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and even from house to house. Write down availability. 
Let's keep it going. Testifying, verse 21, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22, now he goes in, and now, behold, he's saying, consider this. I go bound in the Spirit. Underline that. Bound in the Spirit. Your version might say, compelled by the Holy Spirit, led, driven by the Holy Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that are going to happen to me there. Verse 23, except this, the Holy Ghost has been saying in every city I go to that bonds and afflictions are waiting for me. Everywhere I go, every prayer meeting, someone's getting up with a word of prophecy, and the prophecies are all the same, telling me that in Jerusalem, I'm going to be chained up, and I'm going to suffer. But what does he say in verse 21? Look at this. Um, verse 24, yo, what's he say? But none of these things move me. He just said, I'm immovable. He said, yo, you've seen me escape near-death experience after near-death experience, You've seen all of what I've gone through. You've seen me never throw in the towel. Now I'm going to Jerusalem, and spiritual people have told me by God's Spirit that chains are waiting for me when I get there. He says, but I'm immovable. I'm immovable. Let's keep reading. None of these things move me. Neither, he says more so, neither do I count my life dear unto myself. Underline Paul the accountant. Here he's an accountant. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy. Underline count and put Paul the accountant. Underline course, put Paul the runner. And he says, and the ministry that I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Underline Paul the steward. You see, to count something. He says, I don't count my life as dear to myself. To count something, that's an accounting term. What he's saying is he looked at his life regularly. He looked at all of the assets in his life. He looked at all of the liabilities in his life, and he put Christ in front of everything. Then he says, I want to finish my course with joy. Now he's speaking like a runner with a course to run. He's like, I've got to finish my course. Then he says, I have to be faithful to the ministry I've received of the Lord. Now he's speaking as Paul the steward. A steward was someone that didn't own anything. They were entrusted with something by the master. They owned nothing. They were just supervisors of what belonged to God, and they would later give an account for every single thing. We are stewards. Our life is not even ours. How we live in this day where we talk about carving out time for God. It's, we understand what we mean by that, but really we could fall into this trap of forgetting our life is God's. We don't carve out time for God. We give God our life. And if we carve out a little time and if we carve out some regular time every day, somehow we pat ourselves on the back because we're disciplined in quote unquote carving out this little space for God. No, that's good, but it should lead to us growing and walking more and more. Our life is God's. We're stewards. Nothing is ours. The ministry is not ours. What we own is not ours. The money in the bank is not ours. It changes when we realize we're stewards. Remember, when we stand in front of Jesus, this is what he's going to be. This is going to be the rubric. This is going to be what's going to be discussed. And we will always fall short, but it's about having the right perspective. And then look at this. He says, verse 15, Now, behold, I know that you all among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. He's telling these people that he loves, you're not going to see me anymore after this. Therefore, I take you to record on this day, I am pure from the blood of all men. He's speaking here of the Ezekiel 3 watchman on the wall. There's no warning that I felt was coming that I didn't tell you. There's nothing I didn't tell you to watch out that you should have watched out for that I held back. Uh, I, I, I even was willing to be unpopular uh, in telling you things that maybe you didn't want to hear, but things that were in the heart of God that you needed to hear. He says, I'm, I'm, I've been the watchman on the wall. Every, a watchman watched for what was coming. Everything I saw coming. If there was a party and nothing but mirth and bliss and I saw danger coming, I said, hey, it's time to get on our knees because something's coming. I'm free from the blood of all men. I've been that watchman on the wall, right? Most of all, it's in the context of preaching the gospel. Verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. He's saying, I gave you the whole heart of God, meaning I gave you doctrine and I gave you the duties. I gave you the privileges and the responsibilities. 
You see, if we're a church that just preaches the doctrine without the duty, then we just create a bunch of tadpole Christians. All head, no body. Big heads, full of information, because you're just giving just the doctrine out of the Bible, but not the duty out of the Bible. At the same time, if we just preach the duty and not the doctrine, then we just look no different than the secular philanthropists out there. We're just out there doing positive things, but it has no gospel. It has no preaching to it. If we just, our church that just preaches the privileges, then we turn it to a health and wealth church. Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. I claim this. I don't like this in my life. I rebuke the devil. Everything that I don't like is the devil. Devil, get out of my life. I command blessings. I want this and that. But if we preach the privileges and the responsibilities, then we're preaching that though salvation is free, it's not cheap. And if he laid his life down for us, we ought to lay down our lives for him. We are debtors, the Bible says. So we want to preach the whole counsel of God, the doctrine and the duties, the privileges and the responsibilities, and that is balanced teaching. And it's for every believer to understand you need the balance. So from here, you're going to get doctrine, but you're also going to get challenges. Hey, you got to be doing something with that, right? You're going to get the privileges. Oh, hallelujah. And we need to celebrate the privileges of the gospel even more. We do not celebrate the privileges of being perfectly forgiven and being bought with the blood of Jesus and that, oh, the answer for all guilt, all condemnation, all failure. We don't celebrate the privileges of the gospel enough. But in light of that, we need to also make sure that we're preaching the responsibility we have because now it says we are debtors to go and preach to others what we've received. Verse 28, take heed, he continues unto yourselves. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Now he's telling these elders, be be watchful over what's been entrusted to you. Feed the church of God, which which he's purchased with his own blood. He's reminding them that the church is blood bought. What is your view on church? Do you just count it a blessing to just show up and just everything you see? You pull into the parking lot, this is blood bought. You see the person out there watching the cars. That person's position and that ministry was blood bought. You walk into the church and people are tidying up a little bit of work. That was blood bought. You walk in and we sing his praises and we're here from all different nations and tribes and backgrounds. This was blood bought. Everything here was bought with his blood. Everything. You see the children running to and fro, kids from the neighborhood all coming in, running up and down. Yo, before you even have a word to say about it, did you first remind yourself that blood bought that? Blood bought the right for a kid to call this their safe space? Blood bought the right for the kid to come here and feel like this is the one place where they are safe and don't have to, you know, worry about if they're going to have to pull out the knife in their back pocket just to protect them? Blood bought. Paul's reminding them. Take heed to the church that he's bought with his own blood. It's not an organization, it's an organism. Let's take it a step further. He bought all this with his blood. Everything is blood bought. Standing up here, this pulpit, blood bought. The sound system, even with all of its quirks and weird wires, uh, blood bought. It changes the perspective on everything. When you run everything through the filter of everything you look at is blood bought. Before we're quick to critique it, better it's blood bought. He bought it with his blood. He bought imperfect people with his blood. And because we're imperfect people, everything we touch is imperfect. The whole imperfect thing is perfectly bought with his blood. Hallelujah. Can I get a hallelujah? All right, let's keep going. And he says this in verse 29, for I know this. He says, take heed to the church. Now let's start picking it up. This might be a part two, but I'm gonna try not to. Now he's gonna start picking it up and he says this. First he says, take heed to the flock. Watch over the flock. You ready for this? For I know this. Would you write down church intrusions and church divisions? (laughs) Yo, what would you do if someone told you, yo, listen, it's some church splits coming. It's some church splits coming to this church. And it's also going to be some people coming from the outside, wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, they're coming. Be careful. Be on guard. How many today be like, oh, Google search churches in the area. I'm leaving this church. Paul's about to tell them, yo, watch out for the flock because, yo, some church splits are coming and, yo, some intruders are coming. Oh, see, this is deep. It's the sermon you never heard. Let's keep reading. I know this, verse 29. Not I think this, not I have a hunch, not statistics in church, you know, the latest Gallup study or, or, or whatever it says. No, I know this. After I leave, grievous wolves are going to come in among you not sparing the flock. 
False teachers are going to come in bringing some stuff that sounds truthful, sounds right, and they're not going to spare the flock. They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. People are coming in to gobble up the sheep. Watch the sheep. Then he says this. You know, that, and you're like, oh, wow, that's ugly. Oh, it gets, it gets even uglier. Watch this. Verse 30. Also of your own selves will men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, go and get, get even deeper. Some of the people at the coffee pot in church that you let get coffee in front of you. Some of the people that when you walk into the ladies' room, they walking out. Some people that when you walk in the men's bathroom, they walking out. When your car's pulling in, they're pulling out. Some among your own selves are going to get funny and want to have a mission and want to lead a little clan onto their own little agenda. Yo, this is the sermon you never heard Paul preach. Let's keep it moving. Therefore, watch <laughs> and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. He's like, yo, for three years I'd been discipling you guys on this. And then underlined with tears. Let's keep it moving. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Verse 33, I've coveted no man's silver, no man's gold or apparel. You, you yourselves, verse 34, know that these hands ministered to my own necessities and to them that were with me. Verse 35, I've showed you all things, how that laboring you ought to support the weak, underline that, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, underline this, how he said it is more blessed to give than receive. How many of you have heard that verse, it's more blessed to give than receive? But when you read the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, you never saw it, and you wondered where it was. Wait, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus didn't include this in that Beatitude. This was another Beatitude that Jesus obviously said that the early church circulated that is not included in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, remember what Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than receive. Actually, the beauty, the joy of the Christian life actually comes from giving sacrificially. Hey, now how many of y'all like receiving? Underline, uh, raise your hand. I love receiving. What? You want to bless me today with something? Coffee? Uh, anything. I love receiving. And I, I really give a heartfelt thank you. I love receiving. But Jesus came and said, there's something that feels even better. Giving. It actually feels better to be giving sacrificially than to, be, than to be receive supernaturally. And I love receiving, but I can tell you what, I can amen it. It feels, so, the best feeling on the planet is giving. So let's keep reading. Verse 36, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and he prayed with them all. And they all, verse 37, wept sore. They fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him. Look at the love here. And it says in the Greek, they, they wouldn't stop crying. They know they're not going to see him anymore. He's been with them for three years. They've been in the Word together every day, ministry every day, serving every day. May the Lord bring that kind of love back to the church where we just can't wait to see each other and we're bummed when we have to say goodbye. I praise God that that kind of love does happen here at this church. When we leave on Sundays at night, we don't even want to say bye to each other. And when we see each other again, man, we're so excited to see one another. And if you attend this church and you're like, I haven't had that experience, well, just come on up after service and grab me and Pastor Sherman by the arm and uh, hang out with us all day and, and get swept up in the riptide of love. Uh, it's, 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 it's popping off all over the place. And never mind me and Pastor Sherman, because we might both, I don't know, uh, have to, I don't know, get migraines and go lay down. Follow Janae, follow Deuce, follow, follow anyone that's just here, you know what I mean? Just follow Kathy, you know, follow Jared on the Zoom calls. Yo, it, it's possible, it's here. Get caught up in the riptide of love, it's here. So they all wept sore, verse 38, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they'd see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So let's wrap this up now. Now, after preaching that Paul preached all night, you, don't, you know that I, don't, I, I, I really feel like I could go long today, right? But I'm not, okay. Paul just said this. Now we're going to give Paul's recipe for immovability. Are you guys ready? And you want to have a pen for this. I pulled out of this 11 points. 11 points. Maybe we'll look at this again next week. I pulled out 11 points because here's the reality. Here's the reality. And, and, and please pray for me now because I want to say a lot in a little remaining time. Is that cool? Okay. 
Paul just mentioned that he knows he's going to be arrested in Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be bound. But we actually see, and look, let's do this, right? First, look at verse 24. He says, none of these things move me. And not only did it not move him, but we actually see him saying here in um, verse 16 that he was hasty to get to Jerusalem. So check it out. Not only is he not moved, but he's in a hurry to get there. He's not moved that he knows imprisonment and possible death waits for him, and he's still in a hurry to get there. And he says, again, in verse 24, none of these things move me. I'm immovable. Write down Paul's recipe for immovability. Write this down, please. He doesn't give out a recipe, but if you just look at the man's life, you get it. You follow what I'm saying? Now, here's the thing. Write down Psalms 125, verse 1, and we probably will have to do a part two on this. Write down Psalms 125, verse 1. It says, they that trust in the Lord shall not be moved, but will be as Mount Zion, which abides forever. Come on now, I'm going to start preaching now for a little bit, okay? Here it says, Paul says, I'm immovable. Now, we read that story and know that it's possible to be moved. Like, yo, you ever get a threat on your life? I've gotten a threat on my life, okay, for the gospel's sake. For the gospel's sake, by the way, not for being a knucklehead. You know what I mean? For the gospel's sake, have you ever had a threat on your life for being a soldier of Jesus Christ? I have. Someone else out in the audience, you have. You could be moved. And I, my flesh moved. You're moved. Paul said he's immovable. So we know that it's possible to be moved. You just read Paul's story, and you're like, he just told them, like, yo, uh, grievous wolves are coming in. Some of y'all uh, in the assembly are going to turn shady because you're not going to guard your heart, and you're going to cause factions and take a clique of people with you. Paul said that here, didn't he? Right? He says all this different stuff, and you could just read the story and say, I could be moved by that. I've been doing ministry for 20 years. I see people get moved by this all the day, all the time. My own heart wants to get moved, and i got to grab my heart and center it back, right? That's what fighting the good fight of faith is about. Are you following what I'm saying? But then we read Psalm 125, verse 1. It says, they that trust in the Lord will be as Mount Zion. They can't be moved. So wait a minute. It says in Psalm 125, verse 1, if I trust in God, I can't be moved. Paul is letting you know clearly in Acts 20 that, no, it's possible to be moved. And us reading the story, man, I can be moved by stuff like that. I have been moved by stuff like that. I know people that have been moved by stuff like that and still haven't come back. So which is it? Is it that if I trust in the Lord, I'll be as Mount Zion and can't be moved? Or is it that I can be moved? You follow what I'm saying? Does the Bible contradict itself? No. What you got to understand is the difference between standing and state. Write that in your notes, please. Standing and state. My standing is who I am in Jesus based on the work he did on the cross. My standing is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You follow what I'm saying? My standing is that he that comes to me, I will never kick out, John 6, 37. My standing is no man will pluck them out of my hand, John 10, 28. My standing is that I'm perfectly righteousness. My standing is my name's in the Lamb's book of life and cannot be erased. My standing is that if God be for me, who could be against me? My standing is that he that called me is going to finish in me what he started, Philippians 1, 6. My standing is that faithful is he that called me, faithful is he that will do it. My standing is that he's able to keep me from falling and to present me unimpeachable before the Father with joy, Jude 24 and 25. That's my standing. That's based on what Jesus did. And whether I'm having a good day, a bad day, whether I'm carnal on my A game or not even going to the game, if I am a born-again Christian, that is my standing because Jesus loves me, because he picked me. John 15, 16, he will never leave me or forsake me. The hairs of my head are all numbered, and I'm the apple of his eye. That is what Psalm 125 verse 1 means. I am on the rock. And when the storms of life come, even the ultimate storm called death, I will not be moved. That's why I am Mount Zion. Psalm 125 verse 1. That's my standing. But you only have to study Demas. You only have to study Lot. You only have to study others. You only have to study Peter denying Jesus three times to understand that, yeah, you can have the perfect standing in Jesus, but be in a bad state during your Christian walk. Do you see? 
So what we're talking about, when we're talking about how to be immovable, we're not talking about how to be immovable in your standing because if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you are his, you are his baby, you are good. You're good when it comes to death. You're good when it comes to judgment day. You're good. You will always be his child, the apple of his eye, and he will present you before the Father with joy. That's your standing. That's what Psalm 125 verse 1 means. You are like Mount Zion. The enemy cannot have at you without permission, uh, and even if he is permitted and warfare comes, it's only to build you up because all things work together for good for them that love God, to them who've been divinely summoned according to his purpose. That's your standing. That don't change. And that should make you say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. All that sounds real good in a dry and weary land full of booby traps, you know, uh, pitfalls, you know, banana peels and black ice. That sounds really good, don't it? But all that being said, how many believers, while having a standing that can't be moved, because you're not applying biblical principles, everything moves you. You're emotion-driven, you're not spirit-led, you go by your own inclinations, your own feelings, your own insights, your own smarts, your own education, you know, what others say, you know, church culture, church trends, when the sheep run this way, you just follow, and no, your standing is rock steady, but the state you're in, no, you're not in a good state. You're immovable when it comes to your state. You're like a thermometer. Whatever's going on, whatever's popping off for the day, you know, that's, that, that's, you know the, 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 the tail wags the dog. Your day dictates you, not you in Jesus' name dictating your day. So you can have that great standing like Psalm 125 verse 1 and be immovable but be totally moved by everything. Everything that happens on the other end when the phone rings, on the other end of a text message, on the other end of what the news says, uh, church culture, anything and everything, your own opinions, your own evil inclinations of your own heart, you can be moved all the time. Paul's giving a recipe on how not to be moved here in your state. Do you see? That's what he's referring to. Are y'all rocking with this? Are you digging it? Should I give you the 11 points now, and then next week we come in and un unpack them? All right. I distilled these from Acts chapter 20. And I encourage you to read and find your own points. Because here's the thing. What a lot of us want to, the trap we could fall into, is you want to live any way you want to live, right? Kind of our own little version of churchianity. And then when the rubber meets the road, we want to go hit the spiritual furnace switch on and instantly be fired up for Jesus and instantly be in the spirit. Ignore Jesus all day, follow everything else. Paul was hasty to do God's will. We want to be hasty to go to work. We want to be hasty to get to the mall before it closes, hasty to get to the restaurant before it closes, hasty, you know, to get on vacation, but then we want to be slow in the things of God. But then the minute something pops off, we just think that we can hit a spiritual furnace and the heat comes on. It don't work that way. It don't work that way. It's a practice of a lifestyle. It's a practice of a perspective so that when that day comes, you've been walking in it. Paul's going to share, by listening to him talk, you could see the points that he lived by. No wonder he was in an immovable state, even when he knew that he was about to die. You following what I'm saying? Okay. Point one. He lived with a focus, a burden for the things of God, and a burden for what God had for him each moment. Point one, he lived with a focus, a burden for the things of God, and a burden for what God had for him each moment. You'll get that from verse 16. Two, Humility was more than just a virtue to him, and tears were more than an emotion for him. He saw that as keeping close to the heart of Jesus. We live in a day where people could say, oh, well, let me be humble because it's a Christian virtue. Humility is good. God gives grace to the humble, and we could treat it like it's just this virtue. When in reality, if you read Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being God, a very God, humbled himself and became a man and then came and served us and died even the despicable death of the cross. Humility, you see in verse 18 when he's saying, I've been with you serving you in all humility and in all tears. 
Humility wasn't something that he just saw as just a, a, a virtue, a Christian virtue. It was the very life of Jesus. The tears that he shed, it wasn't just because he was an emotional guy. It was the life of Jesus. He really lived in being close to the heart of Jesus. I really want to give an encouragement to you guys today to just want to really meditate on how much do you seek to be like Jesus. I think it's an interesting phenomenon in the church today where, you know, somehow like if, you're, if your occupation seems to point more at like being a bricklayer or a shepherd or, you know what I mean, kind of that Jesus kind of blue collar work, right? And please understand what I'm saying because all of our hearts need to hear this, that it's easier to picture doing very servile things. But if the job description is something different than the hands-on Jesus, then because your job description is not very hands-on, roll-up sleeves, that somehow you think that therefore your ministry isn't going to look like that. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Let me just share something that's going to blow your mind. You ready? Philippians 2, let this mind be in you that was also in Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus' job description before he came down as God in the flesh. He was the biologist, the molecular biologist, the nuclear physicist holding together every atom of every nucleus of every uranium atom, the accountant, the money manager, knew all the gold and the silver in the earth, balancing out when man will discover what and what it will do to the economy and who will be richer, who, what baby won't have food because of the, balanced all of that. The accountant, the physician, the surgeon, the doctor. You follow where I'm going? And yet he came down and washed Judas's feet. He came down and touched lepers. He came down and let the woman of the night of prostitution actually cry on his feet and clean his feet with her hair. So we need to do away with this notion, and you really see it a lot in American Christianity, that what you do from 9 to 5 dictates how down and dirty you get. If you get dirty 9 to 5, well, it makes more sense to see you get dirty in the church. But if you don't get down and dirty 9 to 5, well, then maybe there's a, something that's not as down and dirty. No, 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 no. Jesus and Paul would say something very different. The Bible says something very different. Are y'all following what I'm saying? See, some messages just get on our toes, but there's only one alternative. We either let the Word of God get on our toes, or we continue to get caught up in a Christianity that ceases to look like Jesus. Y'all going to have to come back next week for the rest of the points. <laughs> Let's have the worship team come up. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for reminding us, and we pray today you've been glorified, Jesus, because you said if you're lifted up, you'll draw all men to you. We pray that right now we're in awe of you, that, Lord, at this time we've ceased to be in awe of anything but you. Thank you for your ways, your word. Thank you that you have a recipe of how we can be immovable in a day with so many moving parts. We could stand immovable in a day of such emotional instability. We could be immovable in a day of such churchianity. We could be immovable in such a, 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 a charged day driven by intellect and man's opinions. We can be immovable in who you are, Lord. In a day of such danger and violence, we could be immovable and still do ministry, still obey you, still follow you. Lord, we just thank you for this sermon today. We thank you for this message. And Lord, we do want to grow up. Would you please continue to grow us? Because, Lord, if we want to compare ourselves with one another, well, it's so easy to find someone you're maybe doing more than. But, Lord, if we compare ourselves with you, and that's the only biblical prescription, everything else is called a fully folly. Lord, if we compare ourselves with you, Lord, there's so much more we want to be like you. Lord Jesus, just thank you today. And we're really asking that you would just cause tremendous change in our hearts Lord, the world does a very good job at making us think very strange. And before we know it, we're mixing a lot of worldly thinking with a lot of our Christianity. But Lord Jesus, thank you that your word is always the answer. And Lord, now as we worship you, Lord, would you receive this tithe and offering, this, this gift of sacrifice, our financial gift to you today. Would you receive it 
as an offering of worship. Would you be glorified with every penny? And may it be used for the ongoing work of showing the world what you look like. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.